Okay, so we had ended up last week, we had finished talking about the tropical rainforest and the savanna. Okay, so now we're moving on to the desert. Okay, so the general characteristics of the desert biome are, okay, um, that they are very dry. Okay. Judith, can you let go on? Okay. Um, so most deserts and semi-deserts actually have uh, relatively sparse vegetation. They're not as sterile as we often view them. Okay, like if you've seen like, uh, you know, what the Sahara, people picture the Sahara to be like, it's like Tunisia, okay, which is where they film like every desert scene for any Star Wars movie. Okay, it's like Tatooine, okay, uh, it's, but very few deserts actually look like that. Only very small portions of deserts actually look like the rolling sand dunes, okay, or are absolutely barren like this picture appears. There's usually, you know, scrubby kind of bushes and cacti and things like that, okay, that are growing there. I'm not saying it's lush by any stretch, okay, but there is vegetation that does manage to get a foothold in there, okay. Um, so. Uh, about a third of the land surface of the earth is actually arid and semi-arid deserts. Okay, so a lot of it is, is very dry. All right, so climate. The big thing for deserts is remember that there are hot deserts and cold deserts. Okay, um, if we're looking at this one here, okay, and we're looking at the, um, the temperature, right, this would be, you know, like kind of a, you know, a a much warmer desert. Okay, we can see that there's not really a bell curve here to the temperature, right? There's a bit of a curve, but not much. This would be uh, near the equator. Okay, but look at the rainfall. That's the telling tale here, right? Zero, zero, zero. Okay, and then I don't know. This might be the equivalent of about five millimeters of rain. Okay, the wettest month is 60 millimeters. Okay, just to give you an idea, 60 millimeters is this much. Okay, six centimeters. It's tiny. Okay, that's the wettest month in that desert. All right, so that does not represent a lot of moisture input. Okay, for certain. Now you could have a more like mid latitude desert if you did. The precipitation would be about the same, but you'd get the bell curve on the temperature line. Okay, so the the thing is, if you're getting uh, a climatogram like you are in your unit exam and you think it might be the desert. It could have a flat temperature line, it could have a bell curve. The defining characteristic would be the precipitation. Okay? In the desert, you are going to be looking at, like in your dry months, between 0 and 10 millimeters of rain. Very, very small amounts. Okay? It's easy to get like the grasslands confused with the desert because they can have similar shapes. Prairies get low rainfall, but it's significantly more than a desert would get. It's significantly more. Okay? If it's going to be desert, you're probably looking at a few months where there's absolutely none. Okay? There's no precipitation. So be careful when you're looking at that. Okay, uh, so we've got all kinds of deserts as well. We've got rain shadow deserts. We have um, you know, like ones that are just going the wrong way in terms of not their moisture is blowing out to the ocean. Okay, they're the interior portions of large continents where moisture just can't get there from the ocean. Okay, and stuff like that. So uh, there's all kinds of different causes for them, but they all have in common that low precipitation. All right, so vegetation in the desert, again, it's going to depend what kind of desert it is. If it's a mid-latitude desert, a high-altitude desert, okay, or a, you know, an equatorial desert, you're still going to get scrubby plants, really short perennial grasses maybe, lots of thorn-bearing bushes and cacti and things like that. Okay, the plants have to be able to survive long periods of drought. Okay, uh, the saguaro cactus develops like a really widespread root system. Okay, so like if you see a saguaro cactus like that, its roots could be 50 meters away from it. Okay, spread out that far, but only about an inch and a half deep. Right? There's no reason for most desert plants to have deep roots. Why? There's no water. It doesn't matter how deep you go. Okay, there's not going to be any water. And in the desert, lots of times you can see a lot of rock on the surface, so there really isn't any soil so to speak of. Okay, so they're better to just have their roots near the surface so that when it does actually rain, they can pull in all that moisture as quickly as possible before it dries out. Okay? Rain and moisture are not going to get a, a chance to penetrate the soil and soak it. Okay? There's not going to be any infiltration okay, in the desert. So having deep roots is only going to work if you can tap an underground aquifer. Okay? And some plants will do that. The mesquite bush can do that. Okay, but most desert plants have shallow root systems that are widespread. 
Okay. Um, incidentally, with cacti, how old does a swaro have to be before it grows its first arm? Yeah, 50 to 80 yeah, years old before it grows its first arm. So if you see a swaro that has a lot of arms, it is likely very old. Okay? Most swaro are just like this one. Yeah, with no arms. Very few of them look like the top of the time, so. All right. Um, okay, so for the soils, again, you can see in that profile, there's virtually no topsoil. Okay? And there's a couple of reasons for that. First off, there's not a lot of vegetation to build one. And secondly, it's always dry, so when winds come up, they blow it away. Right? So you see a lot of soil erosion by wind in the desert, so there just isn't a lot of topsoil there. The B horizon is going to be full of clay and lots of like well-weathered um, rock, okay? so like small chunks of rock. Okay? Uh, and then the parent material okay, will be below that, and it can either be solid, like a sheet, or crushed. Okay? It depends on where you are. Okay, Animals. Believe it or not, there are a wide variety of animals that do inhabit the desert. Not many of them are large, notable exceptions being like the camel. Okay? Uh, but most animals that inhabit the desert are smaller. Okay? That gives them a smaller cross-section, smaller surface area. Okay? All of those things help to limit the amount of water they require and how much um, water they would lose okay? and things like that. So if you are a desert animal, is sweating a good way to cool yourself? No. Okay? If you sweat in the desert, you will dry up like fruit. And so you don't want that. Uh, so most animals are either nocturnal, so they avoid the heat of the day, okay, or they you know are, are close to the ground, scaly, okay, um, or really really drought tolerant, okay. Um, like this rabbit here, for example, okay. Um, lots of rabbits like they don't sweat, okay. The way they cool themselves, you can actually see the blood vessels in the ear. Okay? And so it's a lot like our blush response. Okay? If you start to get hot, you get flushed, okay? and then your, your sweat starts to evaporate off of you. It cools the blood because the blood is close to the surface. When you get flushed, all the capillaries at the surface fill with blood. Okay? And so that helps us to radiate the heat away and make sweating more efficient. Okay? But for animals like this, they don't want to sweat, but they still want to get their blood cooled off. So they have this big surface area within the ears, and they'll just block their ears. Okay, and it can help to cover the blood. Plus, the ears can can provide shade. Okay, all of that kind of stuff. Um, other things like you know feathered animals, like some birds and things like that, they don't use a lot of moisture. Lots of insects. Insects don't require a lot of water either. Okay, you're not going to have any amphibians obviously living here. They require water to reproduce, so they would never survive in this kind of area. Okay, snakes again. Reptiles are a big one okay, in in the desert as well. Okay. All right, chemical cycling is very, very slow. Okay, other than like in the really cold biomes, the desert would be like the next slowest because there's not a lot of decomposing organisms and there isn't any moisture. So you're not going to get fungi growing, bacteria dry out, okay, things like that. So something dies in the desert and it's just going to bake in the sun. You know, scavenger organisms might come along and pick it clean, but the skeleton and stuff like that would stay there for a long time. Plant dies, it's just going to dry out and sit there. Okay? They, really don't, um, they really don't decompose. Okay. Um, all right. Temperate grasslands is the next one. So this is like where we live. This is the biome that we're in, the prairie. Okay? Now, if you look at that picture, it looks a lot like the desert because, well, they often border on each other. Okay, but truth be told, this picture is taken about 40 minutes north of Medicine Hat. So not far from here. Okay, and this is in the short grass prairie, which can have a lot of desert-like characteristics. In fact, there's lots of prickly pear cactus in this picture. Okay, doesn't mean cactus isn't just a, a, an organism that lives in the desert. They can also live um, in the prairies. Okay, and you can see here that it's it's quite dry. Prairies do tend to be quite dry. Okay. So general characteristics, okay, we call them prairies in North America, steppe in Asia, okay, grass and herb dominated vegetation types, so not need some trees, but not a lot. Okay, about seven percent of the Earth's total land surface, but the most important agricultural zones. Okay, uh, so a lot of it is used for farming, which means it is human altered in most places. You very rarely see any natural prairie okay, uh, anymore. Okay, so climate. The big thing for prairies is that their precipitation follows temperature. Okay, when the temperature goes up, the precipitation goes up as well. 
Okay, the winter months are the driest months. Okay, and I know that's that's difficult to perceive because we live in the prairie and we know how much snow we get. It's piled up on the edges of our driveways. Okay, things like that. But what you have to consider here is that every centimeter, uh, or sorry, it takes 10 centimeters of snow to equal one centimeter of rain. Okay, remember, snow is an insulator. It's full of all those air pockets. Okay, so it doesn't it doesn't actually add up to a lot of moisture, not as much as it looks like anyway. Okay, um, and you can see that as the snow begins to melt, it compacts. Right, it becomes hard. Okay? Those air spaces disappear. So snow doesn't represent a lot of moisture. Okay, uh, ten centimeters represents one centimeter of rain. Okay, so um, when you look at this is this is for Calgary, this climatogram here. So we got the bell curve. Prairies are a mid latitude and higher uh, biome, so they're not going to be found at the equator. Okay, and precipitation tends to follow temperature. Okay, wettest month on the prairies June, July. Okay, those are the wettest months. That whole April showers bring May flowers thing is not for us. Okay, April snowstorms bring May floods. Okay, yeah, whatever. It doesn't work here. Um, but it, it is, well, actually, if we get flooding, it's generally June. Okay, uh, reason for that is that's when the snowpack starts to melt and is when we get the most precipitation. It's usually a bad combination. Okay, all right. Um, again, looks really dry, looks really desert like. Okay, but this is near Empress, Alberta. Okay, so southern Alberta. Okay. okay. So, vegetation, okay? We got short grass prairie, that would be southern Alberta. And then you have mixed grass prairie, that would be central to northern, okay, Alberta. So, um, let's say red deer would kind of be the dividing line here, okay? Red deer in north to about, so like Lacklevish, kind of that area, okay? That would be your long grass or mixed grass prairie, okay? And this is your southern Alberta short grass prairie. These two pictures are taken the same week. So we can see that moisture is retained in a mixed grass prairie for a lot longer than it's retained in a short grass prairie. Okay, but there are definitely different kinds of prairie. Right? They share a lot of stuff in common, but there are some notable differences. Mostly the types of grass that grow in each one. Okay, um, short grass prairie is like spear grass and grama grass and like really hardy drought tolerant stuff. Okay, whereas mixed grass is going to have like crested wheat grass, creeping red fescue, okay, uh, things like that. Um, if you get the drought tolerant sod here in Oakley Oaks, okay, uh, it's mostly fescue, okay, and, and it's going to be much more tolerant of dry conditions. Are we going to be asked like identify the difference between the two different? No, just, just, just identify that particular body. Okay, just because this is one that we live, I kind of go into a little bit of detail. Okay. All right. Uh, in terms of oh, this is something. Okay. Okay. Uh, the soils. Big thing for prairies: thick a horizon. Anywhere you have grasses growing, you're going to build up a thick topsoil because you always have a layer of organic material being added each season. Okay. We call that thatch. Okay. That's the dead grass. Okay, um, that from the previous season just sits there. Okay, and, and new grass grows up from the roots. Okay, the old blades of grass do not come back. Okay, new blades grow from below, and so that layer of thatch begins to break down and decompose and build up more organic topsoil. Uh, the bee horizon tends to be fairly narrow. Okay, and consists almost entirely of clay, and then you're going to have your parent material ready to move down. Okay, uh, we, the, one of the big things in the prairie is soil erosion. Okay, that's a big concern, uh, sometimes by water. Okay, if we get you know heavy rain or a big thunderstorm or something like that, sometimes you see channels that we get cut okay, by the running water. Okay, there's a lot of soil that erodes through those channels. Okay? Um, and also wind erosion. Okay? Um, farmers in North America are pretty good about preserving their soil. They realize how important it is. So very rarely anymore do farmers leave soil exposed. Okay? Very rarely do they just like plow and till it up and just leave this to the dirt with nothing growing in it. Because if they do that, it's really prone to wind erosion. Okay? So typically now what we do is what's called zero-till agriculture. So they'll cut the previous year's crop, harvest it, and then they'll seed right on top of the stubble. Okay? Rather than plowing it up like they used to, okay? they'll just, they have special equipment that will seed right on top of the old stubble, okay? and that helps those roots then stay there and they hold the soil in place 
Thank you. Keeping it from rope. Okay. The fauna. Fauna means animals. Do you not see in this picture? Right. Okay. This is a heavily human altered vibe. The normal, natural animals are no longer here. Okay. We have replaced them with livestock. Okay. For example, herds of hundreds of thousands of buffalo are gone. Okay. Buffalo are difficult to manage. They're big and angry. And they don't do what you tell them like cows do. Cows are dumb. Okay. <laughs> but I mean, look in the eyes of a cow. Okay. They're just nuts in there. Okay. <laughs> look in the eye of a buffalo. Watch out. No for you. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, the, the natural animals have obviously been replaced because we have our agriculture going on. We don't want you know, a herd of 100,000 bison to go wandering through our, our canola crop, okay? They'll eat the whole thing down. It'll look like someone took a lawnmower, okay? So we don't want that. So they've, they've effectively been eliminated, okay? They were hunted nearly to the brink of extinction and now really only exist in preserves or special farms where they're actually raised for meat, okay? So we don't see a lot of bison anymore. Uh, we also don't see the large predators that used to be on the prairies. Grizzly bear and black bear used to be dominant predators on the prairie, and wolves as well. Okay? We don't see those anymore because we don't want them around. We have livestock. They'll eat the livestock, so we, we eliminated them. Okay? What's left? Coyotes. Okay? Like the coyote is the top predator of the prairie. Okay? And that's okay because they still do a useful job. They kill mice and gophers. Okay? And they'll take down, if there's a pack of them, they can take down anywhere. Okay? Uh, but most of the time, they're they're only taking care of the small stuff. Okay? If you have chickens, well, you may have to worry about that. Okay? Uh, but other than that, coyotes are really not a threat. So we don't see a lot of the natural animals that used to live on the prairie. Okay? Uh, so habitat loss, incursion of early settlers, spread of cattle and sheep okay? uh, resulted in the virtual extinction of animals over most of that range. Okay? So that's what we see instead. All right, uh, chemical cycling for a mid-latitude biome is fairly quick, okay? Things do cycle fairly well here. I mean, nothing compared to the tropical rainforest, but they still cycle fairly well because there is a, you know, a period of warmth and there's conditions that are good for decomposition and things like that, okay? All right, the temperate deciduous forest biome. Now I've combined a couple of things in here, okay? The temperate deciduous broadleaf evergreen and sclerophyllous forest biomes. They kind of combine the Mediterranean. That's the sclerophyllous. Okay? Um, just don't worry about it. Okay? Just go with deciduous, temperate, deciduous forest. Okay? That's what we're looking for here. All right. So the big thing with temperate deciduous forest is that it's the most complex forest other than the tropical rainforest. There are layers to this forest. Not as many as the tropical rainforest because it's a mid-latitude forest. But the big thing is, is that the leaves are shed each year. What does that build up on the ground? Yeah, dead stuff, leaf litter, okay? humus, okay? stuff that can decompose, helps to retain moisture in the soil. If you've got layers and layers of leaf litter sitting on top of the soil, the soil doesn't dry out nearly as quickly. So it helps to preserve that moisture, which is why trees can grow there, okay? whereas you know, it would be more difficult for, um, you know, for like grasses and things like that. Okay? Um, so about 9% of the world's land surface, okay? climate, it's much more moderate than the prairies. The big difference here, because temperature-wise, they're similar. But it's the precipitation that tells them apart. Okay? A temperate deciduous forest is going to have relatively even precipitation all year. Okay? There's not going to be a definite wet during the summer months and a definite dry during the winter months. It's going to be much more level across the board. Okay? They get a lot more snow, a lot more wet snow than the prairies do. Okay? I mean, you've kind of seen what we get here. Very rarely do we get heavy, wet snow here. Most of the time, it's light, dry snow. Okay? Uh, so that's that's the big thing, okay, on a, climat on a climatogram for a deciduous forest is curve with even precipitation that's relatively high, okay? We're looking at most months being between, you know, 40 and 65 millimeters of rain, okay? And that's every month. Okay, so vegetation, temperate forests are just are dominated by oak, beech, hickory, smaller qu uh, quantities of understory trees like butch, 
birch, birch, hazel, and sycamore and maple. Okay, uh, the broadleaf evergreen temperate forests are concentrated in more humid zones. Okay, and are composed mainly of oak, magnolias, and palms. Okay, and sclerophyllous forests are found in the Mediterranean. Okay, and they are going to have drought tolerant species like olive, sessile oak, and pine. Okay, we actually see um, like the sessile oak and the uh, wandering pine. Uh, we actually see those in some places in like Crow's Nest Pass. You can see uh, limber pine and things like that okay, uh, in those areas. Um, so like the tropical forests, they have a vertical structure. So there's the undergrowth and the understory and the canopy type trees, just not eight layers of it. Okay? Competition for light is a big factor. Okay? If you get shaded out, you don't do very well. So um, trees in the deciduous, uh, in these biomes are, like we said, deciduous, so they lose their leaves each year before winter. All right, soils, typically a pretty good A horizon with a definite organic layer on top. Okay, all that leaf litter takes a while to decompose, okay, but it also means there's a lot of soil organisms. Okay, so lots of worms and bugs and things like that that are going to be able to be active in the soil, okay, even into the early winter before the soil freezes, okay, because they've got that layer of, of uh, leaf litter and stuff on top, okay, the soil retains its moisture very well, okay, the B horizon is quite thick, okay, and uh, the C horizon is well below that. Now, when areas like this are cleared for agriculture, okay, are they going to be as good as a prairie soil? No. Okay, once that leaf litter is gone and it's tilled up and ready for cultivation, it does not retain its moisture in the same way. Okay, it's not as good for that. It can still be used for that, but sometimes it has to be irrigated, okay, things like that. All right, um, so high rainfall often results in the washing away of nutrients and needle fall, okay, because sometimes you'll have the deciduous uh, spruce, okay, like the larch and the tamarack, okay, you guys seen those? They look really cool in the fall. The pine tree that turns like fire orange and loses its needles every year. Okay, that can really acidify the soil if you're in an area where those are present. Okay, the animals. Fairly long food chains for a mid-latitude biome. Okay, because you can have a lot of smaller rodents and, and things like that living in that area, lots of insects, and because of the, the nature of deciduous trees, you can have large herbivores as well. So you're going to have moose and elk and caribou and okay, uh, things like that. Okay, and you're going to have um, intermediate sized predators and larger predators. Okay, so um, lots of different types of, of pred predaceous organisms in that biome. And again, lots of rodents, birds, okay, pretty prevalent because there's lots of nesting habitats and things like that. Okay. Um, so for chemical cycling, okay, uh, it's pretty quick. Again, for a mid-latitude biome, lots of moisture is retained, lots of insects are available, fungi can grow because they're shaded through the winter or through the summer months. Okay, um, so yeah, there's there's lots of opportunity for that. Um, considerable quantities of nutrients are retained in the soil as well. Again, all that leaf litter really locks that in and it provides more as it decomposes. Okay. All right. Um, Okay, the taiga. So the taiga is like if you go to northern Alberta, okay, or you go into Banff or Jasper, Kananaskis, that's taiga. There's alpine taiga and then there's arctic taiga. Okay, so this would be a picture of like alpine taiga. And you can see there's not a lot of diversity here, right? It's a carpet of spruce trees, right? And that's it. There's just spruce and spruce. There's different kinds of spruce, right? But there's like five different tree types and that's it. Okay. Um, so 9% of the Earth's land surface relatively undisturbed because it tends to be in pretty remote places that are hard to get to. Wildfires can be a problem. Okay, we saw that in 2015, okay, the Fort McMurray fires. Okay, um, that was a huge deal. That whole area had, was a very old growth taiga. Okay, and uh, there was a lot of like diseased trees and things like that. They were just sitting there dead. Okay, there was a lot of dead fall. There was fuel everywhere. Okay, it was bound to happen at some point. And, and a lot of our tega in Canada is of that nature because it's all about the same age. Okay? And it's all about the same age because it's where the glaciers have most recently receded. Okay? So these, these biomes are all about the same age. They're very old. Wildfires are going to be a problem because of the nature of the forests as they mature. Okay? These are very old growth. There's a lot of dead trees in there because they only live so long okay and and now they're going to be fueled okay all right so climate okay 
the big thing with the climate of the taiga is okay, that we have um, low rainfall, but fairly even. Okay, it does follow the temperature a little bit, but it tends to be fairly low. This is a relatively dry biome. Okay, um, we can see here rainfall. The wettest month is about 60 millimeters. Okay, um, but it's a lot more even, and it's much later in the year. Okay, um, and our temperature. All right, you can see it's definitely a curve, but the curve is very low. Okay, um, you know it's going to get. Sometimes you can get you know 30 degree temperatures, but for the most part in that area, you're going to get like highs of about 15 degrees in the peak. Okay, but you can get down to minus 50 in the in the Tega in the winter time. Okay. So um, winter can persist for obviously more than half the year, just like it does here. Okay, most snow that collects on the ground surface uh, will actually run off because the ground under it will be frozen when it melts. So it doesn't actually get to infiltrate very much. So the snow melt doesn't actually end up providing a lot of moisture. Okay, so vegetation, like we said, not diverse at all in the Tega, but mostly lichens, black spruce, gay, white spruce, larch, short grasses, etc. Okay, uh, all plants are frost tolerant and must limit their growth to short periods. Okay, um, obviously the growing season in the Tega is only going to be a couple of months. How do all these trees live with such low precipitation? Well, they're just adapted to that. Um, they live in soils that are typically quite thin. Okay, uh, needle leaf trees do not require nearly the um, water demands that a foliage, like deciduous type tree, would require. Those are much more water demanding, which is why you don't see them at higher altitudes or further. Kind of makes sense? All right. Um, the soils, okay, uh, you're going to have some A horizon. It's going to be a bit acidic because of all the needles. Um, and it's also going to be much thinner because these soils tend to be much younger. Okay, so this is a bit misleading here. Uh, most of the places in Canada where this would exist, the B horizon would be very small. Okay, and the rock would be near the surface. In fact, sometimes you see spruce trees growing right out of the rock. Okay, the soils are very, very thin. Okay, um, and so there's not a lot of organic material there. Okay, animals. This, this is where like this biome kind of gets interesting because these animals have to adapt to very harsh conditions. They have to be able to adapt to extremely high temperatures in the summer, extremely cold temperatures in the winter, okay? Somehow survive all of that. You basically have two choices, hibernate or migrate, okay? Now, not all animals hibernate either. Some animals stay active throughout the entire year, okay? But a lot of animals will simply migrate to camp, okay? So most of your birds are going to take off and fly south, right? The animals that stay, okay, need to adapt to the extremely cold conditions. So some of them will use the snow as an insulator. And okay? we talked about why snow is a good insulator. But you could have it minus 40 be the air temperature at ground level, okay? But in the little burrows, the temperature could be above zero. Okay. And so these animals can stay warm if they, as long as they stay in their burrow and as long as the snow doesn't get packed. Okay, If the snow gets packed, it loses its insulative value because the air gets forced out of it. Now it's just solid, it's tightly packed, and it conducts the heat through very, very easily. Okay, uh, So we have to be careful about packing the snow. Uh, that can ruin the insulative value of it. Okay, Other animals will go dormant. Okay, now, there's true hibernators, and then there's the animals that just lower their um, their activity level. A bear is not a true hibernator. We always associate hibernation with bears. They actually don't hibernate. True hibernators lower their metabolic processes to a nearly dead level. Okay? If you were to find a ground squirrel in the wintertime and pick it up, it would feel cold and dead. <laughs> okay, but it's not. Okay, but they curl up into this ball. Their body temperature drops below 10 degrees Celsius. Their heart beats only a couple of times per minute. They respire once every couple of minutes. Okay, they lower their metabolic processes down so you would think they were dead. Okay, but they hardly use any energy. Okay, all throughout the year they've been squirreling, no pun intended, squirreling away like seeds and nuts and stuff like that. Okay, they put on their fat stores and they're just running off of the fat stores. Okay, throughout the winter, right? 
Now, something like a bear hides in its cave or you know, its, its den or whatever, but it doesn't really lower its metabolic processes. It just doesn't go outside very much. Okay? Uh, it's also got a nice big layer of fat and can most, mostly run off of that throughout the winter because a lot of its prey are gone or hibernating or whatever. Okay? Um, and berries are obviously already gone. Okay? The rivers are frozen over. You can't pull fish out of them. So they have to just lower their kind of activity level and live off of their fat, which is why in the spring you don't want to mess with it. Okay? You know what it's like to be hangry? Well, imagine you haven't eaten for a couple of months. Okay? Yeah, because you're, you're going to end up your big and have claws. Okay. All right. Uh, speaking of having claws, okay? What's this thing? That's a wolverine. Okay? There's a reason why the superhero is named after it. It's because it's a big claw. Okay? Because these things are ferocious. Okay. Imagine packing all the anger and ferocity of a grizzly bear into something the size of like a German Shepherd. Okay, but a super concentrated grizzly bear. Okay, they will rip you apart in 200 pounds. Yeah. They're ferocious predators. Okay, uh, and they're really good at actually maneuvering even in the snow. Okay, they have like the wide paws, kind of like the lynx does. Okay, that allows them to stay on top of the of the, the snow okay, rather than fall through it. Okay. I don't know if you've ever seen those like videos of like uh, the Arctic fox hunting the Arctic hare. The Arctic, you know, they, they'll run they'll run along and then all of a sudden the hare will disappear because it'll actually tuck itself and like just fall into the snow and the snow will cover it and the fox can't find it. Okay. Yeah. It's one of their escape mechanisms. Okay. Anyone ever had that happen to them where they're walking and they're really in the mountains in the wintertime and all of a sudden they fall in and they're up to your waist or your chest? Yeah. It's hard to get out. It's a little scary. But yeah, that's okay. The adaptations are like that. Okay. Also, animals in the in the taiga may change their, their colors okay, throughout the year. Okay. Arctic fox and Arctic hare are prime examples. They have their summer coat that's not as warm okay, but, uh, and darker in color. And then they have their winter coat okay, that's obviously camouflaged uh, for the snow. All right, chemical cycling in the taiga is incredibly slow. Okay, because it's frozen so much. Okay, not a lot of fungi gets to take hold. Okay, uh, so it takes a long time for anything to break down. Bugs are only active for a few months of the year. They can't really help all that much. Okay, so things take a really, really long time to decompose in the tag. All right, last one. Arctic and alpine thunder. Okay, so the date on this picture. This is July the 6th. Okay. What do you see here? Snow. And lots of okay. Snow is going to persist through the tundra through the winter or through the summer. Obviously through the winter. Through the summer. Okay. It's not going to melt. Okay. There's going to be permafrost, which means the soil is going to be frozen to within a few inches of the surface, even in the summertime. Okay. The challenge for any organisms that live in the tundra is to take advantage of those few months where sunlight is available, temperatures are reasonable. Okay. Now the sunlight thing isn't such a big deal because there's going to be lots of it if you're in the Arctic country. Or, yeah, the Arctic country because it's, the there. It's, flat. it's flat and the sun won't set. Okay, once you're above the Arctic Circle, okay, from like May until August, the sun doesn't go down, right? Because you're pointed towards it. Okay, same as it well, in the winter time is the opposite. Right, the sun never rises for two three months. So they do get a lot of sunlight in that short period of time. Okay, um, mountain or alpine tundra does have an additional challenge in that it is high altitude, so it can be exposed to high levels of ultraviolet radiation. Okay, you can get a sunburn so can plants. Okay. All right. Um, so the big thing here is tundra means treeless. Okay, there's going to be no trees in there. So tundra is characterized by intensely cold conditions. Okay, and the development of permafrost, so frozen soil. Um, you can see here the climatogram is showing a definite bell curve, and that bell curve is positioned very low. The warmest month is not even a double digit high. Okay, coldest months, very cold. Okay, and looking at the precipitation, this makes it look pretty wet, but it's a matter of scale. Okay, the wettest month is about 60 millimeters of rain. All right, um, so some of the, the drier months where it's mostly snowfall, okay, looking at 20 millimeters of rain. So it does tend to follow the, the bell curve a bit. Okay, but the bell curve is going to be really, really low. Okay, so vegetation, tundra means treeless. Okay, this is alpine tundra. Okay, again, taken early July. Okay, so it's still a lot of snow there. But snow is important because it actually protects the plants 
um, in the winter time from the extremely cold temperatures. Okay, um, so uh, you're going to see mostly sedges, grasses, and more grasses apparently. Dwarf shrubs, lichens, and mosses. Okay, and like I said, snow cover is important because it protects them from icy winds and ice abrasion. Okay? If you've ever been in really cold when the wind is blowing, okay, if ice crystals start coming off, like it can be like a sandblaster. Okay, it can, it can really irritate your skin. And if you're an exposed plant, it's just going to strip everything off you, bark, all of it. Okay, that's it. Right, I'm going to give you about three minutes here, and then I'm going to start doing chemistry review. Oh, shit. Thank